Hey, everybody. It is crazy to think that this is a, gosh, this is my 45th closed and fund related strategy related YouTube video, but it is. Um, gosh, it is. Uh, crazy to me. So my name is Daniel Young. I'm the owner and founder of Adaptive Perspective. Um, and I cannot get my computer. That's what that's what happens when you do live videos. No editing. Uh, I believe it's my purpose, my calling to help you identify your dreams and help you reach your financial freedom destination and maintain it so you can pass your wealth on to the next generation. Uh, yeah, this video will continue my closed and fund strategy uh, and show what that contains. Uh, as I said, it's an unedited video. So who knows what you'll hear in the background as I film these in my house. And who knows what other snafu you'll, you'll get to watch me make on my video. Uh, disclaimer. So see the full description, or I guess see the full disclaimers in the description. Uh, what I'll mention here is that I am not a financial advisor. I am a strategist and uh, that I don't speak like the herd. Um, it's not bright lights. It's not, uh, gosh, it's not that really cool uh, ring display. It's. I'm, I'm really just a down-to-earth guy. Uh, but I, I don't speak like the herd. Uh, I walk in limited company, and sometimes I walk alone, and I'm okay with that. And I'm going to, uh, I think, walk alone again this week. So strategy. Uh, what do I mean by strategy? So as I've said before, it's if you look at most of the financial memes that I've hit so far, and if you look at, the bulk of what you see online, everybody's advising. Well, I won't say everybody. Almost everybody is advising a uh, single stock, single entity buy-in into the market, and you're buying in at a really high rate. You're buying at a really high price for a, a shitty dividend and a lot of risk. And risk not so much because of what you're buying, but risk on the hope and premise that that stock will go up leaps and bounds by the time you're ready to sell it because the game plan is that stupid 4% rule. So the game plan that most brokers advise and most brokers follow is one, it's a 60-40 split portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, and hopes that they even out and, and do the best in the long run. The follow-up is that they focus on stock gains, not so much dividend payments. Uh, and then third is that they focus on the 4% rule. So if, think about it, if you stock up a million invested into the market, now, are you really going to hit a million into the market? I have no idea. Okay. But if you hit a million into the market, because that used to be the, recommended retirement amount in the market. It also used to be said that the market would gain at least 4% a year. So the guy who came up with the 4% rule is not living on the 4% rule. He found that it paid too little. So the 4% rule is you could sell 4% of your portfolio's value every year and rely on the market to go up 4% so that in premise, in theory, what you would have in whatever portfolio you were built, that would go up 4% too. So you would sell off 4% of your portfolio and you would somehow build back 4% of your portfolio. So you would get a net, like you'd break even. But the 4% rule is trash because if you trust the Fed, which I don't trust the Fed, but if you trust the Fed that they're going to keep inflation at 2%, do you really think it's going to stay? It's going to be at two percent. That's the goal. They're hawkish. They're all this stuff, right? But inflation pretty much lives at four percent. Um, so if you sell off four percent a year, you're losing four percent to inflation a year. Now, if you think the if you think the Fed's accurate and it's two percent, then great. I think. 4% is more accurate, but maybe we could meet the middle, say 3%. So you're going to sell 4% and inflation is going to eat you with 3%. That's 7% a year. 
most people consider, you know, so I'm retiring at whatever age. And maybe you'll live 25 years. Maybe not. Maybe it's shorter. Maybe it's longer. But think of the starting salary of any blue and white collar worker. And you're automatically making more than 40 grand a year. Uh, ballpark my salary. Um, let's say a 15 year teacher is making above 65 near Houston. Okay. And that's only going to go, well, it's not going to go up a lot. It's like a $300 pay raise on salary schedule year, uh, followed by a 3% inflation raise uh that's labeled a raise and yeah that's bullshit uh but that's that's not that's neither here nor there per se for right now but the important thing is the overall salary so if you're making a cool 80 grand when you retire and you're used to living off 80 grand when you retire do you honestly think you're going to cut back your spending by half because your income will reduce from 80,000 to 40,000, right? So you're primarily invested in the market. Maybe you set up supplement, supplemental retirement. If you're a teacher, maybe, maybe FTRS, and you're not invested in the market. And you're relying on the state to not sell off your pension fund. Um, yeah. So let's say you have a million in the market, and it's you and a spouse. And if your spouse is included, so if you're retiring and it's you and a spouse and it's just your retirement account, it's going to eat into that 4% a lot more. So there's 4% withdrawal, 3% for inflation, that's, that's seven, right? But that 40 grand withdrawal isn't going to be enough for you. So if you're used to being on 80 grand, if you're used to being on 80 grand, that's an 8% withdrawal. And if it's you and your spouse, like if your spouse was working prior to prior to retirement, that's another 8%. And let's say they're not working. Uh, so if they're not working and y'all are surviving on one paycheck and you're making 80 to 100,000 a year, that's eight to 10% of that million. So we'll say 10 because it's a, it, it's a slightly higher percentage, right? So there's 10%, not 4% taken out every year plus the three percent inflation so your portfolio is losing 13 percent a year and it's supposedly gaining four percent a year so you're actually losing nine percent of your portfolio a year if your spouse was working prior to retirement and is now not retired you know not now retired and y'all are taking money out of the same retirement account maybe you could make it work on 40 grand maybe not but we'll say 40. So that's another 4% on top of your 13%. So now you're now you're down. No, so you're losing 9%. Now you're at another 4. So now you're down 13% a year. That's a lot of money. It's a lot more than 4%. So the 4% rule is flawed. It is misrepresented. It is poorly explained. And it's bad strategy. I mean, the, the guy who developed it is not living on 4%. He's living on more than 4% because he found it didn't offer him enough. Um, and in this turbulent market, you're going to have, you're going to struggle to make 4% back in, in sheer in sheer price alone. Now, is it possible? Yes. But the method I'm presenting you and the strategy I'm presenting you is that we not rely on selling our principal investment. So, or our portfolio value. That's not the point. Let's focus on dividends and shoot to retire on dividends or supplement your retirement on dividends. So if you could build a portfolio that gave you an, let's say an 8%, 8% is conservative right now, but at 8% of that million investment, your million dollars would stay intact. Now, it would never matter unless you sold it. Right. But let's say the market fluctuates. So your million dollars flatline. And if the market goes up 4%, then down 4%, guess what? Your dividend payment still happens. 
And if you had to sell your portfolio, then you would have to sell it, right? But the goal is to not sell it. The goal is to live on the dividends. So if you take your million dollars and you take 8% of a million dollars, now that's an $80,000 dividend annual income that's still taxed, right? But you're not selling off your portfolio. You just get paid. Now, you can up the ante. Our, our current portfolio is a little over nine. I think, well, I restructured. It might even be over 10. Um, and I restructured it because I found out some of the, um, I can show you. Yeah, our current portfolio is over 10. Um, and it's it's been a consistent 10%. So 10% of that million invested is $100,000 a year in dividends and the principal stays intact. So would you be interested in seeing that? Would you be interested in seeing how that works? One, or actually how it's working for us, one. Uh, and then two, would you be interested to see where that investment or what that investment looks like this week? Or I guess what advice, what strategy we can put into place this week? So let me share my screen. So this is our closed in fund portfolio. No, excuse me. This is our closed in fund master. Um, this is all current funds that will get updated next Saturday. Uh, every single fund gets updated monthly. Uh, the targeted funds, anything with an asterisk gets updated weekly. Uh, and then I try to keep these. So the, the black, or I guess the dark gray sections uh, are yields under six or pricings over 16. And occasionally you'll find a line uh, of recommended by other people uh, that has a higher than 16 pricing or a uh, lower than 6% yield. But since it's recommended, I denotate that. So anything in green, I'm tracking for one reason or another. Uh, anything in purple is recomm recommended by people I trust and read. And everything in blue is stuff we own. Uh, our portfolio. So the math of this portfolio works to where every section, um, say has math at the end of the section. Um, so this total is all of those individual totals per stock. Um, so that yield is related to what we're spending and gaining out of this category. And what I had done, so in every section is the same. So the top is monthly. These are alternate, uh, like they pay quarterly, but they don't pay exactly on a straight uh, category one, two, or three scale. And then these are the individual categories. Category one pays one, four, seven, ten. Category two, liquidated. Um, I mean, I would love a category two overall, but my my focus has been uh, upping certain stocks to, or uh, upping certain funds to 200, but also my focus has been on our monthly base level dividends. Um, yeah, so we sold that one. Pink just means I don't know the X dividend date yet. Uh, but all these categories are calculated based on category. This was, this overall yield on cost, was just uh, the individual categories divided by five, or by total category. And it heavily weighted, or I say by, by doing it that way, it heavily weighted or weighed down the overall yield. So I went back through and put in every single yield and then divided that by our total uh, stocks owned or closed in funds currently owned. Uh, and it didn't change much. It, it changed from nine to 10, <laughs> uh, but it changed a little bit. And then our overall dividend return after two and a half years is almost 10 and a half. And that being said, it will jump significantly Maybe not. So it'll jump probably 2%. Uh, 
uh, by the end of the month because the August payments have not happened. Well, the majority of the August payments have not happened yet. They're slated to pay, but I don't update this dividend tracking uh, until the payments actually post. So hopefully that will jump to 12 and a half, maybe 13 uh, by the end of August. And then as our portfolio value fluctuates, right? Like the market becomes a dumpster fire and then it comes back better. And then the market's a dumpster fire and then it comes back better. And the market's a dumpster fire and then it kind of comes back. And then it's a worse dumpster fire, right? As all of that happens, our dividends still get paid. So even though our portfolio is down anywhere from, gosh, in the last year, I think we fluctuated from minus 2% to minus minus 16%. While all of that happens and changes, and I, I get that it can be stressful. Uh, I mean, I update this sheet once a, uh, once a week. So I, I update the master on Saturday, and then I update our uh, overall profit loss or so the individual cost per fund on Saturday and Weeble tracks our overall portfolio value, but they don't track the uh, dividend return of investment. So like it's kind of stressful. It was real stressful at the beginning. It's, it's not as stressful now. So as that value changes and Weeble goes, Hey, you're, you know, 15% down when, when the market's just a, unfortunate trashy dumpster fire that's kind of stressful but it only matters if we sell and you'd be like, well yeah the market could plummet it could right and we would still buy more stuff uh because we could buy really low because the market will come back the market regardless of the market tomorrow when it opens right the market always tracks forward and the people who weigh it down in the immediate future are the new investors and all those people online and, and on new shows preaching and, and just preaching and funneling doom and gloom, right? If you look at all the experts, they're, expert, they're experts on a lot of different stuff. They're experts on the market and then they're experts on the commodities and then they're experts on the consumers. They're experts on oil. They're experts on this. It's like they all cycle the circuit and all these experts really aren't experts. Um, but those are the people controlling all these new investors who get freaked out. And then the new investor money into the market gets gets rapidly put in and then rapidly pulled out. And everybody's stock prices go up and way down. Right. And all of us in it for the long term aren't really taking our money out. Now we might sell funds, like I sold this one based based on their investment strategy, not um it was a lesson learned the hard way. They paid an obscene yield. And uh, I took a chance and that did not work out, but you live and learn. Uh, am I better today picking funds than I was two and a half years ago? Gosh, yes. Uh, we're going to get into that. But this is our portfolio. So if I ever make a membership out of the system, you get full access. You see like a viewer file, I mean, you see the companies where I'm tracking and why you get the full list of funds and, and what, like the full version of what's uh, inside of these windows. And you see what we did last year and how that worked. You see what we own. Uh, the one guy whose service I pay for talks about the funds in a specific portfolio, but it, it's like tracking one individual share. Um, so it's like a buy-in price, the dividend amount, the overall yield, and the the money returned or the, the return of investment on one share of that buy. And our portfolio, you get to see everything. Um, yeah, you get to see everything. So what we have, when we bought it, how it's doing, if I scan over, you get the overall. Uh, so IGR is, is like 99.9% .9 real estate. Um, we bought it at seven overall, right? It's currently at 517. So you see that loss, 
overall, but then you also see the dividend payments and what that loss and what that gain is. And then you get to see them together. So the total ROI dividend to dividend to overall fund value is this. This amount relates to the loss in value off the fund. It does not factor in this amount. It will when we sell it, which is why you can see it here. Um, so you see it here. It's uh, overall return of dividend was not a ton because we didn't own the fund. We didn't own the fund that long, uh, considering. But the overall return, twenty three percent on the stock, six percent from the dividend, gave us an almost thirty percent total return, which is obscene. Like that's crazy. Um, and I, I mean, I, I love this fund. I picked this fund. Um, I went on. A, I went out on a limb and picked this fund. Um, just unfortunately, it for whatever reason they liquidated it. Um, so how I pick videos or pick data? This is the video from last week. We're going to duplicate. I'll show you a little bit of what. Probably not a little bit. I'll show you how I go about doing things. So this is every fund in alphabetical order. We're gonna sort by discount. Um, I, I'm, I'm not interested, like I'll track this fund. I think it's interesting the discount is so significant, but at the same time, um, it's, inter it's there's a little inconsistency in the data. Their website has a lot of information. What the closed in fund sites I follow, what that information is, is, is a little different from the website. And of every person I read, of all the stuff I read, I haven't heard one person mention this company yet. So it, it's an interesting track just based on the discount. But um, and it the the discount has come down a little bit. I mean, it used to sit in the fifties. Forty four is still steep, but it's not fifty steep. Uh, so we'll rank by discount, and then we'll look at target and. Honestly, we're going to sort all this other stuff out. So one asterisk is uh, tracking for, I uh, should have an asterisk, is being tracked for some reason. Purple is recommended, blue we own. Uh, but we're targeting based upon the discount. So three asterisks is a buy -over. Right. It's either double the historical yield or it's double the five-year yield or both. And sometimes it's it's factored into funds being below premium. Some funds just sit above premium or uh, sit above break even. So they sit in premium territory. You're paying more for them than they're worth. So when those drop into discount territory, they get a free asterisk. Uh, two asterisks are dollar cost averages based upon our portfolio and one asterisk is tracking for whatever reason. Like it's not a dollar cost average. Um, like DSL is selling for, well, let's check. DSL is selling for less than our average uh, buy-in, but uh, it's not there yet, but it's selling for premium. So we're not going to pay premium for that. And you'd be like, well, heck, you get it's a great dollar cost average. That's true. But we're going to base this primarily on the discount. And then we'll get into the overall yield. And then we'll get into the overall price. So if, if we screen it with discount, in mind, like what's the best deal for our money that makes it a little easier and more justifiable than just the dollar cost average in, in the individual share price of the yield. So 
by doing that, we eliminate a ton of funds. Yes, we track a ton of funds, but since we're only interested in significant discounts, it really does trim up the list. Current is what we currently own. I always like to know what we currently own when it comes down to buying. So we're not going to buy anything we don't already own. Um, I mean, the longer I look at this fund, it's tempting, but we already have two category three investments and not exactly wanting to add another one right now. Municipal bonds. Uh, I mean, you can kind of see a little bit of what they have. If we bought a fund right now, it would go back. If we bought a fund right now, did it make the list? It did make the list. All right. If we bought a fund right now, this fund is tempting. It's very comparable to this fund. Um, that's when you look at overall dividends. Now, just because this discount looks smaller than this discount, you have to compare it to the individual data for that stock. So HFRO jumped up again to almost 40, gosh, 40% 40 off. So it's like you're getting the stock for 60 cents instead of the, like for every dollar you're investing, you're, you're investing 60 cents and not spending the whole dollar, which is obscene, crazy. Um, historically, the discount's about 15. Five-year discount's about 19. That's double of both. Uh, say six and a half, right? Five-year discount's actually premium. And the, his the historical discount is break even. So 6%, 7% might not seem a lot compared to 40% but it's significant for this individual stock. But that being said, we're not gonna add a fund right now. So we're gonna take these off, take everything not in blue off. So if we, so we, we do discount first, right? That determines our targets. And it's not just that it has a crazy discount. It's a, it's the discount in relation to historical data. So now we can come back and look at yields. I've been targeting everything over 9%. And that's a huge list of funds that for the most part pay monthly. Um, ZTR is a portfolio and it can, like a little bit of everything. HTY is heavy tech and semiconductors, but like its own portfolio that way. BRW used to be uh, just senior floating rate loans, but then they added their own closed and fund division inside their portfolio. Uh, HGO, like you can see in the description, HGOB is real estate, vacations, energy. I have not seen a closed-in fund with their level of um, communications investment. We'll, we'll look at their sister fund in a, in a little bit, but to look at the sectors they're invested in, I've not found another closed-in fund as heavily invested into communications as HGLB. And that's not to say it's like 20% plus. I think it's like 16, 17%, but that's a lot more than I've seen elsewhere. Uh, the NCs are banking and built for convertible and preferreds. HFRO has that stupid, stupid, crazy high discount. Uh, and it's bond-based. FG, F, uh, FGB is uh, all like private equity, business development company. EOD is all technology, semiconductors, microchips. KYN is energy transfer, utilities. Uh, oil, and of the list, let's rank them by discount again in reverse. 
if based on my knowledge of our portfolio and based on where I think society is headed, as much as I love these funds, I'm targeting these four. Now, for us in our portfolio, we already have 250 of KYN. We've got 200 of FGD. I think we have 100 of HGLB now, because I took my own advice from last week. I took my own advice from last week. I bought 100 shares of HFRO, about 50 shares of HGLB, and 50 shares of HDY. I left this one off. Um, and then I made a later decision to buy another 50 shares of EOD, which is that category one uh, technology, heavily, techno uh, heavily technology based portfolio. Um, excuse me. So if you want consistent payments, that's the top two. Um, if you want small business development, business development, and private equity, that's the third one. And oil, whether you realize it or not, will control these top three. Um, private equity and lending depends upon our economy, and oil runs our economy. And whether it's communications, even though this is, is bonds, it's got some other stuff, technology, and all aspects of technology. This laptop, the mouse I'm using, my phone, your laptop, tablet, or phone, um, all the microchips, all the fans, the semiconductors, uh, pacemakers, all the stuff in our houses, all of that technology is a derivative of oil and the and the other processes that, that happen with oil as we manufacture. Like oil comes in raw and as we we hit that petrochemical that pipe that petrochemical pipeline, all the other derivatives make all the technology possible. So you could say we need an oil society and all the technology would fizzle at, at either in either a become non-existent or be skyrocket in price both on the manufacturing side because they need oil and it's at, and its attributes and its other derivatives in order to make that stuff right and they would pass on that cost to us and everything would get more expensive than it already is okay our our society thrives on oil and not not from the gasoline side of things right that's its own other thing but all the technology that you like, that phone you have, your car, your car that's driving, right? Whether that be electric or water powered or hydrogen powered or gas powered is dependent upon oil, right? The street you drive on, dependent on oil. All those light poles, dependent on oil, right? Society would crumble if we went oilless. So I get that KYM does not have as high of a yield. Now it's close, right? And it pays quarterly. Doesn't have a, as high as a yield as the top two, but it's still just as important because the top three depend upon KYM. Okay, but for our portfolio and where our needs are, it's hard to divide these, these four companies out. Of what we currently own, this is why I like to track it. Okay, now, in the current economy, utilities are a great investment, right? But I could make the same argument for all four of these. HFRO, the, the data coming from the people I read is, is mixed. The Fed will probably make another rate hike. Bonds? people are running from, but it's a good place to invest your money right now. Uh, a lot of the bond funds I like, uh, so DSL is a bond fund, but it's in premium territory. FAX is a bond fund for the Pacific Rim, but I, I'm not certain how China's economy is gonna go. Um, 
China really does control that that area of the world's economy. So as their economy goes, so does everybody else's. Um, you could argue it's a great time to invest because one, that, that stock price fax is a lot lower than it has been. Two, it, it hits our dollar cost average needs. I think it was like four when we bought it, four on standard when we bought it. Uh, yeah, 343, it's currently like 265. That's a great dollar cost average. But in order to better fill the data, their current discount is not greater or not two times greater than their historical or five-year historical data, All right? So it doesn't meet the qualifications to make the short list. So the best place, I won't say the best, like the easiest uh, position to it, recommend, strategize is HFRO because the discount is just sick. Um, crazy discount. And with that, you get an amazing yield and a, an incredible buy-in and a ton of access, which is what I pulled up. So this is HFRO based on closed-in fund or CEF Connect. Uh, and you can track their dividends. Very consistent. Pricing. Now, on that, they haven't grown, right? But it's a very consistent dividend. Pricing, you can look overall. Not that old of a fund, but based on their dividends, it looks like it, the fund got restructured. Current portfolio, based on March's data, so like stocks, bonds, et cetera. If you want a different snapshot, go to Morningstar, and it's very bond heavy. And that's their little pie chart that says the same thing, bond heavy. And the article I pulled up to reference for part of it, so I, I do, I pay for and read the contrarian outlook. Anything they put out, I read, whether it's on their site or on somebody else's site. If it's Brett Owens or Michael Foster and it says contrarian outlook, I read it. Uh, this is from May. So I'll let y'all pause the video and I'll let y'all read this. Um, HFRO, nobody knows about. Well, I'll say a few people know about it. I know about it. I'm talking about it on this video, right? But if you watch mainstream, which I don't watch mainstream, but if you, if you watch mainstream and Forbes and Motley Fool and all that crap, they don't talk about HFRO. They talk about BlackRock, probably for more than more than just the reason of BlackRock pays a, a nice dividend, right? But they don't talk about HFRO. Most people don't know about it. They should know about it because as that price dips, which we can go back to this master. So let's, here's the interesting thing about tracking funds. So that's our current buy-in, 8.99, we'll say. That's our average. Watch what happens to that yield. It drops, right? So the, as the share price goes up, the dividend stays the same. As the share price goes up, your yield goes down. As the share price goes down, your yield goes up. Now, KYN says they're going to raise their dividend as they acquire their sister company. Uh, so if they raise their dividend to what they say, it'll jump up in that 10% category. Okay, and taking these, these numbers, if you plug them in here, you can see the dividend at the end of the year what you would gain per period or per dividend payment uh, distribution. So KYN looks like it pays a healthy dividend, and it does. It does. Uh, gosh, it does. Let's see. Train of thought. So dividend to period, it look it looks like these are a lot less than that, right? But 
those top two pay monthly. All right, so in the same amount of time, you're getting that one $52 payment, 52 50 cent payment. You're getting three payments of that amount for 46.2. And if you're investing the same amount, oops, wrong one. 1925. Now you're making more than that. Right. But it's a consistent monthly payment. Now, that being said, oil will power the other three. And I can equally add, or I can equally strategize for all four of these. I would pick HFRO. Yeah, because it's bond heavy. Bonds are a great investment right now, and it's got this crazy dividend or a crazy discount. Uh, HGLB, the price dip, um, the price dip, right? And it's got this crazy dividend or it's got this crazy discount too. Uh, private equity, great way to get into small business uh, development and business lending at a significantly cheaper price than what you would do otherwise, right? Uh, and it's got this crazy discount. And then oil, energy transfer, utilities, pipelines, all of the needed stuff for our infrastructure. But it's not just the concrete and the driving infrastructure. It's the overall infrastructure for our economy. Yes, it's got the gasoline. Yes, it'll play into the diesel a development of the roadways, the bridges, and the buildings, but it's also integrated into technology far more than people realize. Right? We get crutches from oil byproduct. We get pacemakers from oil byproduct. We get computer parts and mouse parts and, ta and tablet parts and phone parts and Tesla parts and car parts from oil byproduct. We are more, we, we are bankrupt without oil we are dependent upon oil and when we don't make our own oil and we export we're importing somebody else's exports and what we do make we're exporting right that's not helping our economy so i can equally strategize for all four of these you're going to have to figure out what you want to invest in because I'm, I'm not i'm not going to tell you where to put your money and that's the different and that's the difference in strategy my my advice what is i'm not an advisor i don't want your investment money i want to teach you how to invest yourself i want to teach you how i go about making decisions for us i want to teach you our system uh, but my goal is that you manage your portfolio P pick your platform our, our portfolio is on Weeble. right pick your platform self-manage it, right? Cut the fees, right? And then make your decisions for you. My top four for the week are here. And I can I can advocate for any of them, okay? Of the four, what's the best decision for you? If it comes down to price, that's FGB, it's cheapest, right? If it comes down for the long, long, long play, right? That depends on everything else, that's KYN. If it comes down to bonds, right? And in the short end, like you're not going to hold HFRO for life, then that's HFRO. It's got the it's got the steepest, sickest discount. Pays a healthy dividend and it's paid it for forever. Uh it comes it comes highly recommended. Right? It's bond heavy, which is great for our current market. And it's cheap compared to what it's been. I mean, really, I, I can advocate for any of them. You're going to have to make up your own decision of which one you want or if you're going to take the advice anyway. So I'm, I'm not going to force you to do anything. So, um, I, and I really do mean it. I, I don't talk like the herd. It's not, you're not going to find me on Motley Fool for regardless of how well this goes. Not going to find me on the Motley Fool. It's the Fool for a reason. You're not going to find me on Forbes and all that other stuff because I'm not going to sit there and say you need to buy this stuff. Okay, my style is 
here's what here's where I'm looking and why. I don't want your money. But now make the best decision for you. And then keep learning. Now, let's be honest, if it became a membership, would I charge a membership fee? Yes, because it's a lot of information. It's a lot of data in one place. But whatever money you're putting into the market, I don't want. Invest it in the market, learn and keep going, keep growing and grow that money. Right. And if you like our dividend system, then go with it. And if you don't like it, that's fine. Right. But know your strategy when you invest. Because if you have no idea what your strategy is, you're going to get lost really quick. And you'll get pulled and tossed this way and that and have no idea what direction you need to take. Right. So learn, investigate, pick your strategy and go. And it's not that your strategy has to be set in stone. Right. Our strategy has improved over time. My ability to pick uh, funds and have a specific system has, has developed and improved over time. I mean, compar comparing now to two and a half years ago is unfair. It, it, I know more. I do more. I understand more. I apply more. Right. And I didn't have that two and a half years ago, but now I do. So picking one of those four. Um, I don't know if I could pick one of those four. I mean, I would have to if I was going to invest. Um, my goal has been to invest into the funds that we're keeping long term and get those uh, scaled up to 200 shares. So I might, if I, if I had to pick one, I would tie with the two at the top, HFRO and HGLB, because we already have 200 shares of FGB and we already have 250 shares of KYN. Uh, but that being said, I mean, KYN, same. KYN, it, it's a dollar cost buy. Oil will be in it for the long run. They're going to increase their dividend. They're going to what? They're going to acquire their sister company. So, um, yeah, I, I I really can't. I can strategize for all four. So. <coughs> Those are my top four for the week. So if you like the content, if you like the commentary, if you like to watch me troubleshoot random crap that happens, uh, then by all means, consider subscribing to my channel. Head over to Facebook, find me there. Uh, find my group called Navigate Your Finances. Uh, and then remember, you're the captain of your ship. You make your decisions. You're the captain of your ship. You have the power to change your life and your financial future. Many people will offer to help you but only you can make the choice to do it. So make it happen and shock your world. This is Daniel Young signing off. I will see y'all on another video. Bye-bye.